going back to what we started now countless hours ago about how wrong I am. So we just had an election, and in a few weeks, it looks like we will have a new president. As I write this video, it appears that Biden has won, and that the various legal challenges that the Trump campaign is mounting will not change that. Of course, if Biden pulls through, that means that I have called the election correctly, right? Didn't I predict that Biden was going to win? Well, yeah, I did the whole map thing on Twitter and it held up reasonably well, but that's not what I'm referring to. Remember those videos that I made back in the summer? That's when I predicted Biden would win, right? Well, not exactly. Let's look at my specific prediction. A month and a half ago, I made a video about how Trump was currently losing. The point of that video was not to make a prediction that Trump was toast and that Biden was definitely going to win. The video was mostly a defense of polling in and of itself. I think polls are the best way to gauge public opinion when it comes to elections. And since Biden is leading in the polls, I think he's going to win. The polls were off and by quite a bit. Biden just happened to win anyways. We don't know how wrong they were until all of the votes are counted, but as of now, they appear to have been off considerably in the presidential, Senate, congressional, and state races. They were wrong systemically and in one direction. In other words, regardless of the outcome of the election, I was wrong to put my faith in the polls, and won't be doing that going forward. Maybe it's just because Trump was on the ticket. Maybe it's because people don't answer their phones like they used to. Maybe people are just lying to pollsters. I don't know. Regardless, as far as I'm concerned, polling is only slightly more credible than astrology or gimmick predictors like whose Halloween mask sold better. So if you want to, you can head over to those videos and type in, well, this video didn't age well. <laughs> you see, one thing I've learned in my 31 years on this earth is that if you're wrong about something, whether it's at work, in a relationship, or here online, just admit it. It's so much easier and so much more liberating than digging in your heels and pretending that you're actually right. There's a man here on YouTube who is 19 years my senior who has yet to learn this lesson. Jank Uger of the Young Turks. Years ago, Jank made a bet with Anna that Donald Trump would not make it through a full term in office. He was also wrong about some other down-ballot races in 2020. So he acknowledged this on air, but he did it in a classic Jank way. Going back to what we started now countless hours ago about how wrong I am. Um, <laughs> so I paid Anna the bet uh, earlier today, and if you case we were wondering off camera, I did actually give her the money and the $400. And, uh, and at this point, Trump ain't leaving anyway, um, et, cetera, et cetera. All right, so we started out with me being wrong there, and, and and I'm looking at my pool that I filled out here, and I was wrong again, uh, and so I've I think I've learned my lesson, and I'm wrong on both of those for the same exact reason, and it's the one thing out of all the things I should a mistake I shouldn't make, which is uh, so for example I thought the Democrats were going to pick up five Senate seats, okay. You see it on the top right there. Um, so I'm, I'm less worried about the Electoral College in this context, more focused on the Senate seats that I thought they were gonna pick up and they didn't. Because I keep thinking about how weak uh, the Republican position is. That you know, you see the polling and you see how many voters that Trump has lost. And so you think, well, I mean, how do you lose to this party, right? Schmuck, Democrats can always find a way to lose. <laughs> and I underestimated that when I said Trump would be driven out of office. Well, that would require the Democrats giving a 1% effort, right? Uh, and instead of a negative 20% effort. And, and so I kept just looking at the Trump side of the ledger. And we saw it in 2016, I should have learned my lesson right there. There isn't anyone that the Democrats couldn't lose to. Of course, the Democrats didn't lose to Jank's preferred candidate, Bernie Sanders, so what does that say about him? But that's neither here nor there. This is Jank 101. Even though I was wrong about this specific thing, it just goes to show how right I am about the other things I talk about. Even when Jank is wrong, he's never really wrong. When you've watched Jank Uger as long as I have, you realize that he has a grand unified theory that he thinks explains everything. Money in politics. 
When Jenk talks about money in politics, he's referring to two separate but related constituent ideas. First, there's the idea that you can buy a politician. Donating money to a politician's campaign produces policy outcomes that match the preferences of the donor, not necessarily those of constituents that the politician is supposed to represent. I will not be addressing this one today. The second claim is that you can buy an election. This is the idea that the winner of a given election is almost always determined by who spent more money on campaign advertising. This is what we'll be looking at today. This is one of Jenk's most unshakable beliefs. He believes it so strongly that even examples that run counter to it prove that it's correct. For example, when Jeb Bush spent $138 million on the Republican primary in 2016, only to drop out after the third contest with next to nothing to show for it, Jenk saw this as validation of his unified theory of politics. It proved one thing to me about uh, Jeb Bush's the debacle of a campaign that he was. It, it's an ironic proof of it. Um, that money in politics matters a lot. You can say, wait a minute now, guys, uh, Jeb Bush had the most amount of money on the mm -hmm. Republican side, and he still got slaughtered because he's such a bad candidate. He wasn't willing to eat a baby. <laughs> well, that's that's part of it. But uh, my point is that the presiden presidential election is uh, is the exception that proves the rule. There's so much free media in the presidential election that you can't sw uh, swarm other people with just your money. Right? Because Donald Trump's going to go, hey, I'll eat a baby, I'll kill Muslims with pig's blood or whatever. Right? He'll say all these different things and g gather all the attention. And so he'll get hundreds of millions of dollars on free media, and your $120 million in ads isn't going to be able to beat him on it. But look at how terrible a candidate Jeb Bush is and how easily he won uh, as governor of Florida several times because that pathetic. Pathetic, bungling candidate. Come on, give me a break. Come on, give me a break. That guy won easily in Florida because he had more money. And Florida's a very expensive state. Right. When you don't, when you don't have uh, the free media that you have in a presidential election, which you have in almost no election, all the state elections, local elections, mm -hmm. no, all you have is money. Whoever's got more money will, will get in the media. Recognition. And name recognition. So Jeb Bush, the worst candidate we've seen in a long, long time, when the spotlight of free media is not on him, and all you have is the dark money floating around, he wins in a landslide. He wins in a cakewalk. So does money in politics matter? Hell yes, it does. Look at Jeb Bush's career before he got exposed for the like, my he, God, that, that look at how bad he is. Just to touch on the specifics of Jeb Bush in Florida, Bush actually lost his first gubernatorial race in 1994 to the Democratic incumbent Lawton Childs. Bush lost despite the fact that he outspent Childs. To be fair, Bush did win the next two elections handily while also having a major fundraising advantage. Of course, I'm sure his victories had nothing to do with his famous last name. Or the fact that he got a key endorsement from Willie Logan, a high-ranking black Democrat in Florida politics. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that during his second campaign, he pivoted from campaigning as a conservative ideologue to being a consensus-building pragmatist. You know, the sort of thing that would gain traction in an incredibly diverse purple state. Unlike the presidency, voters are oftentimes not looking for aspirational qualities when selecting state and local officials. They prefer people who seem like competent administrators. Which, whatever else is true about Jeb Bush, he was that. No, I'm sure it's just because he outspent his opponents, even though that didn't work for the first time for some reason. 2020 was an especially bad year for Jenks' unified theory of politics, given that there were a number of high-profile races where the candidate who spent more money lost. Of course, that's just anecdotal evidence, which admittedly is not very compelling. What do the stats say? Well, there are a few numbers floating around there that generally show a high level of correlation between campaign spending and political victories. They usually show that the candidate who spent more money wins about 90% of the time. I think the best way to describe how he views himself and what his role is, is that he's an American Ayatollah. He's an American Ayatollah. Because over 90% of the time in these congressional races, the candidates that win raise the most money. So this guy has the ability to make or break you. He could cut you a few checks and that's it. He makes your political career. He makes it so that you win your seat. Why should anybody have that kind of power? The number changes depending on the source you use and which races they examine, but the results are pretty consistent. So, Jenk is correct then. Case closed, right? 
Mm, not quite. People love to throw these statistics in my face whenever I talk about how I think money in politics is an incredibly overrated factor in American elections. I'm sure some progressive moron who made his way to this video has already brought up one of these statistics in the comments section. I love it when people comment with what they think is clearly a devastating point before even watching the entire video, because I'm about to show you why those numbers are nonsense. These stats are kind of like the wage gap, in that, yes, if you crunch the numbers, you get those results. But the conclusions that people draw from them are erroneous. In the case of election stats, there are good reasons to believe that correlation between money spent and political victories does not equal causation. The first problem with these numbers is that they're definitely inflated. If we look at open secrets, in 2020, 89.1% of House candidates who spent more money won, while 69.7% of Senate candidates who spent more money also won. As you can see by this chart, these numbers are fairly consistent over the last 20 years. Most of those races, however, are uncontested. This means that, of course, the candidate who spent more money won because he or she effectively, or sometimes literally, had no opponent. For example, Democrats didn't even bother running a candidate against Tom Cotton. His only real competition actually came from a libertarian candidate, and sadly, that didn't make for much of a race. Of course, politicians in safe states or districts win while spending more money, because there's no one on the other side to spend. No one in their right mind thinks that these candidates wouldn't have won were it not for the spending. Of the 435 congressional races that took place in 2020, only 41 were considered battlegrounds according to Ballotpedia. That's just 9.4% of congressional seats that were actually contested. If we look at the Senate races, Ballotpedia only considered 16 of the 35 races to be battlegrounds. That's just 46%. So what happens to the spending numbers if we weed out all of the gimme races that only look at the ones that are actually contested in a meaningful way? Well, I did some calculations and here's what I found. Out of the 41 congressional races, only 15 candidates won while spending more. That's 36.5%. 25 candidates won while spending less. That's 16.9%. As of the writing of this video, only one race has yet to be called. In Iowa's 2nd District, Republican Marionette Miller Meeks leads Democrat Rita Hart 50.1% to 49.99%, with 89% of the vote reported. Hart spent $3,045,957 during the campaign to Miller Meeks' $1,281,444. If we look at the 16 contested Senate elections, we we see that six candidates won while spending more, that's 37.5%, whereas eight candidates, 50%, won while spending less. As with the House, all of the candidates who won while spending less were Republicans. That includes high-profile races in Kentucky, where Amy McGrath outspent Mitch McConnell $73 million to $43 million, and South Carolina, where Jamie Harrison's campaign spent a whopping $104 million to Lindsey Graham's $60 million. The Georgia races are still not decided, but for the purposes of these statistics, they were evenly split. John Ossoff spent more money than David Perdue, but got fewer votes, whereas Kelly Loeffler spent more money than Michael Warnock and got more votes. Since neither candidate in either race got over 50%, they will go to runoffs per Georgia law. I have no doubt that gobs of cash will be spent on those races. So if we look at just the races that were actually contested, we actually get a negative correlation between money spent and winning elections. I have not run the same numbers for previous elections, so I don't know what those races would show. That said, while 2020 seems to have been a particularly weird election for a number of reasons, a lot of the academic literature on campaign spending seems to suggest that there's no good reason to believe that spending more money increases the odds of winning. The most well-known book to tackle this myth is Freakonomics. If you haven't read the book, you really should. It's definitely worth your time. If you don't want to, though, there's a video clip here on YouTube of the authors talking about this subject, why it's a fallacy, and why the myth is so pervasive. I won't play it here because I don't know the copyright status of it, but the link to it is in the box below. Instead, we're going to look at a seminal paper on the subject written by one of the authors of Freakonomics, Stephen D. Levitt. The title of the study is Using Repeat Challengers to Estimate the Effects of Campaign Spending on Election Outcomes in the U.S. House, the University of Chicago's Journal of Political Economy in 1994. Prior to Levitt publishing the paper, most of the academic literature on the subject suggested that campaign spending by challengers had a large positive effect, whereas spending by incumbents had little or no effect on election outcomes. Levitt believed that most of this literature was inadequate because it failed to control for two important factors, candidate quality and what he calls district-specific factors. As Levitt writes, failure to control for candidate quality will lead to an upward bias in the estimation of the impact of the challenger spending because high-quality challengers will 
will have a greater likelihood of winning, and therefore will be able to raise a greater volume of campaign contributions. In other words, the qualities that make a congressional candidate innately attractive to voters looks, charisma, confidence, intelligence, strong networking skills, etc., also make for a capable fundraiser. So, while it is true that they're spending more money on their campaign, it's possible that the causation works the other way around. The candidate who has a better chance of winning has more opportunities to raise money. Concerning the district-specific factors, Levitt provides what I hope is a familiar example. Differences in partisanship across districts are an obvious source of such effects. A Democratic challenger in a staunchly Republican district will likely encounter great difficulty in raising campaign funds and will also obtain a low percentage of the vote. Since the race is unlikely to be close, the Republican incumbent's expenditure will also tend to be low. Thus, in a cross-sectional model, differences in partisanship across districts will lead to an upward bias in the measurement of the impact of the challenger spending and a downward bias on the effects on incumbent spending. So, a long-shot challenger probably won't be able to raise much money, but the incumbent won't feel the need to spend a whole lot since he or she is likely to win anyways. Hence, while incumbents in these situations will likely spend more overall, the differences will not be that divergent, making its effects on the end vote total seem more pronounced. Levitt attempted to correct for these shortcomings by building a model that controlled for the factors as well as possible. He measured the effects of spending in districts where the same candidates faced one another for a second time. Under the assumption that an individual candidate's quality is constant over time, a fixed effects transformation eliminates all influences of quality, as well as other districts specific fixed effects. In other words, if you have the same two people running against each other in the same district, but the amount of money spent changes, you should be able to get a better idea of how much that actually changes things. So what did Levitt come up with? The results I obtained differ sharply from those of previous studies in two respects. First, I find that campaign spending has an extremely small impact on election outcomes regardless of incumbency status. According to my estimates, an extra $100,000 in 1990 dollars in campaign spending garners a candidate less than 0.33% of the vote. Controlling for candidate quality and district fix effects reduces estimates of the value challenger spending to only one-tenth of the level typically obtained in previous cross-sectional studies. Despite relatively small standard errors on the estimates, I am unable to reject the null hypothesis that campaign spending has no effects on election outcomes. Second, while I find challenger spending to be marginally more productive than incumbent spending, the difference is greatly reduced compared to previous studies. So, Levitt does think that campaign spending can make a difference, but it's pretty negligible. In a 2012 interview, he put it this way. When a candidate doubled their spending, holding everything else constant, they only got an extra 1% of the popular vote. Same, if you cut your spending in half, you only lose 1% of the popular vote. So we're talking about really, really large swings in campaign spending with almost trivial changes in, in the vote. Obviously, there's a lot more to say on this subject. Perhaps in the future, I'll examine some of the other studies on this. As far as this most recent election goes, though, Jenks' unified theory of politics hasn't held up that well. The idea that spending more money significantly improves a candidate's chances of winning seems intuitive at first. After all, more money means more advertising, which means more exposure, which you would think means more votes. But if you think about it a little harder, you may start to appreciate the limitations of advertising. Consider the YouTuber The Amazing Atheist. He is, as his name suggests, an atheist, an anti-theist, a nihilist, a far-left radical, and has a history of saying and doing controversial things. He also lives in Louisiana, the dirty boot of the South. Democrats do get elected in Louisiana, but do you honestly think that, even with a massive campaign war chest, we could get TJ elected to any political office in that state? Do you honestly think that a bunch of super conservative and religious rednecks would vote for a controversial internet celebrity who doesn't share their politics or their values if only they saw a few 30-second TV ads promoting him during the commercial break of a college football game? Somehow I doubt that. And the reverse holds true as well. Do you think the only thing stopping a bunch of wealthy, whole food shopping, Prius driving yuppies from Connecticut from voting for a conservative Republican is that they get more flyers from Democratic candidates? I seriously don't think that's the case. If Jenks' unified theory of everything, aka money and politics, was true, then how would these ridiculous scenarios not follow? As usual, with Jank, when you start to unpack what he says, you realize how clueless he actually is. Of course! <laughs>